Now, I want to talk to you about this, Apple's new iPad. It's already become the most talked about gadget of the year, and you can see why. Whatever you may think of Apple's products, whether they're works of pure design genius or just bits of overpriced fluff, there's no doubting the influence they've had. Take the iPod. It wasn't the world's first MP3 player, but it's changed the way we listen to music forever. And the iPhone wasn't the world's first smartphone either, but it's changed those forever as well. So, will the iPad change anything forever? Well, to try and find out, I took one along to Gadget Show Live. I'd be comparing it against two other portable devices, an Acer laptop and an Arcos tablet PC, over a day each at Gadget Show Live. I'd be checking the morning news at breakfast, keeping up with work throughout the day, and fulfilling my portable entertainment needs once the show had ended. Naturally, I began with the iPad, which features an LED backlit multi-touch screen and uses the iPhone operating system. Like the iPhone, the iPad is very much an apps-based experience, and many of the early apps seem to be news-related. I found these more user-friendly than the newspaper's own websites, and of course, the iPad is much more compact than a newspaper. One of the best apps so far, I think, is for Marvel Comics. It's really been well thought through. You can look at whole pages and scroll through them. You can easily zoom in on frames by tapping them and scroll through those. It really hints at the iPad's potential to shake up electronic publishing. During a quick break between shows later in the day, I used the iPad for my second round of testing, checking emails, browsing the web and word processing. I was expecting the keyboard to be pretty useless on this, but actually, it's better than an iPhone's and really not bad at all. And the web browsing experience is really pretty good. You've got this lovely tactile screen coming into play. You can really navigate yourself around web pages by touch very quickly. It's all very responsive. However, because it doesn't support Flash Player, it can't play vast numbers of web videos. It lacks simple connectivity like a USB socket, and I found the word processing rather basic. For example, the Pages word processor doesn't even have a word count, so I don't think it'll be a full replacement for a laptop. Goodbye. Goodbye. After a hectic day on stage, I began my final test, checking out how much fun I could have with the iPad. And I immediately found the clarity and responsiveness of the iPad screen hugely entertaining, both for watching movies and playing games. I'd had a great day with the iPad, but how would it compare against its two rivals? On day two, I began testing this Acer Aspire laptop with its 13-inch screen. The screen is just too big to qualify the Acer as a netbook, but it's certainly portable. And it's got a low-voltage processor, which promises better than netbook performance, but with an eight-hour battery life. The Acer has a comfortable, glare-free reading experience, but its LCD screen is two-directional and colours aren't as true as the iPads. Now, obviously, this has got a full operating system, Windows 7 in this case, so it's not a matter of instant on, you have to wait for it to boot up. But once it does get going, I think actually it's a bit quicker at web browsing than the iPad. Later in the day, the Acer really came into its own in my second test when I used it for office duties. Obviously, when it comes to things like emailing and looking at Word documents, the laptop excels. Unlike the very limited iPad iWork applications, I can get a proper look at my script, I can count the words, for example, and I can also do a very good job of typing on the keyboard. I mean, I could type my novel on this if I wanted to. But for my final entertainment test, the Acer was limited to fairly basic games, even though the HD screen, the biggest of the three, made a fair job of my movie trailer. On day three, I moved on to the Arcos 9, a tablet PC with an 8.9-inch LED backlit touchscreen. The Arcos is similar in size and feel to the iPad, and it comes with this rather handy stand, which is really quite useful at the breakfast table. It's got a resistive rather than a capacitive touchscreen, and it's in widescreen format. Now, the resistive bit should allow more precise control, but the cost of that is that you often have to resort to using the stylus, which fits in around the back, which is OK, but I find I'm always losing them, and it is a bit of a fiddle, generally. I moved swiftly on to my second test, evaluating the Arcos's work functions, and I was immediately disappointed when I tried some typing. The keyboard is awful, really. You've got to give it a really hard shove, um, and it's easy to hit the wrong key. I find it very difficult to enter just one email address I need. Um, and there's an optical trackpad, a tiny one at the right-hand side of the screen, which is rather neat, but unfortunately, I've lost my stylus.
Although it uses a cut-down version of Windows 7, the particularly slow processor makes web browsing a really frustrating experience. It's crashed, though, is it? <laughs> Finally, I went on to test the Arcos's entertainment abilities. It seems all a bit hit and miss whether it can actually play HD video. Sometimes it runs smoothly, other times it becomes all jerky as though the processor can't cope. And gaming was even worse. It's even struggling to run this simple game. And so, on to G ratings, and it's just one G for the Arcos. It's just too slow, frustrating and fiddly to use. The Acer gets four Gs. It's compact, good value and very competent, but it wasn't really suitable for gaming. And I'm going to be generous and give four Gs to the iPad. It was less useful than the Acer for many tasks, but I enjoyed using it the most, and it does have the potential to change portable computing forever.